Okay. Welcome to October Energy Month at CGTC. This event is in honor of Energy Awareness Month, an initiative of the U.S. Department of Energy celebrated every October. At the Caribbean Green Technology Center, we wanted to highlight some of the amazing things that are happening in our community related to renewable energy and clean energy sources. Uh, during the first webinar, we discussed solar energy. Uh, last week, we learned about electric vehicles, and today we will hear about local solutions uh, to, or to become more sustainable. Uh, besides hosting outreach events such as today, the UVI Caribbean Green Technology Center has recently partnered with the VI Energy Office to develop a comprehensive energy strategic plan for the Virgin Islands. The aim of this plan is to outline potential strategies, actions, and programs that will bring the Virgin Islands together towards a brighter, cleaner, and sustainable future of energy management. The plan will establish both short and long-term objectives for progressing the territory's energy sector in alignment with community principles. The events of this month help to emphasize the importance of developing a vision for the future that is paired with goals and strategies to help us achieve it. And each of the areas that we've talked about in these, uh, in these webinars really highlights initiatives that can be grown and enhanced here in the Virgin Islands, especially if we set our minds to it. Um, Okay, someone just asked for live captions, sorry. Um, today, we will be discussing local solutions for sustainability in action. We will hear from Michael Bourne about Vinzia's solar uh, program, Kenneth Mills at Gift Hill School about their aquaponics, Aaron Hutchins at Leatherback Brewing Company about going 100% solar and their recycling efforts, Nija Youssef, at Plaza Extra East on St. Croix about its solar rainwater harvesting and reverse osmosis system, and Arnold Rahelio about his work uh, going off the grid and doing water pump retrofits for the homeowner. And so now I'd like to hand it over to our first presenter, Michael Bourne at the VI Montessori School and International Academy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us and really excited about this initiative. And I know a lot has to be presented in a short time, so I'll get right to the point. Um, VI Montessori School has been an environmentally friendly school for a long, long time. And yet we continue to improve our systems and programs so that we continue to reduce the impact we have on planet Earth. And since 2012, one of the big initiatives is that we've been 100% solar. Uh, we have saved approximately $1.4 million in solar and, and WAPA costs over that period of time. I'm sure WAPA wasn't very happy when we started that in 2012. And that allows us to do so many more things in consuming energy, solar energy to enhance education in the Virgin Islands. That $1.4 million has also gone a long way to help us maximize teacher benefits and, and education benefits. Uh, Peggy, go ahead. Those of you are not familiar with the campus, we're on the east end of St. Thomas, as I said, and when I say we have a solar system, we actually have so, uh, seven solar, solar fields and we're constantly increasing them and storing and adding value to, re to preserve our zero carbon footprint. Recently, a year ago, we announced a program where we also have electric vehicles. Presently, about 20% of our staff drive electric vehicles. We charge our electric vehicles, Nissan Lease, at the school with solar energy. So it's a terrific program. Teachers get the cars on a very favorable lease program. We maintain them, we insure them. The teachers get terrific value, and we're helping save planet Earth. And we will continue to buy cars as long as more and more students, more and more teachers want the vehicles. And we anticipate going literally every day. Um, in addition to solar vehicles, we recycle 100% of our, actually, well, let's, I'm sorry here, let's go back to the road runoff system where we instituted when in the construction process, we capture rain runoff off the roads surrounding our campus into 200,000 gallon 
systems, which we use for irrigation purposes. So rather than letting that water run off into Red Hook Bay and pollute the bay, we capture it and use it to water our plants and our soccer field. We also recycle 100% of our sewage. The sewage is captured at the bottom of the hill, re reprocessed and pumped around campus to irrigate the campus um, with much success. We're very elated to have that plan as well. Um, go ahead, Peggy. The, the water that we do not capture in the 100,000 gallon cisterns, we have a retention pond which captures that excess and other excess and takes it into the aquifer. And once again, reducing the road runoff into Red Hook Bay. And one of the future goals is to drill a well to complete our sustainability cycle so that we actually have our own water as well since we are replenishing the, the aquifer. But that, that's a project to come. Go ahead. Of course, years ago, we thought we were innovative in starting to recycle, but we've now been doing that, as I say, for donkey years. And we continue to recycle aluminum and we hope to expand that program continuously, but we've been recycling for probably 20 plus years. And uh, it's just one of the foundation things that we do in educating our students. In addition, we did another creative project recently, or well, actually not recently, time's fine when we did that several years ago. We have taken tires from our local distributors and to beautify campus and also to hold back our infamous St. Thomas rock sides. And so one man's waste is another man's gold, and that's what we incorporated there. Um, and then of course, after the hurricanes, we had WAPA throwing away poles and we salvaged them. And out of that, we've gotten many projects. Our soccer field now has lights. Uh, we built a telephone pole building and we've also built a uh, seating for our soccer field, all complements of hurricane damaged telephone poles. When we expanded the campus and we paved driveways, we worked with the Port Authority and we took the asphalt off the uh, Cyril King Airport and we use that as pervious asphalt to pave our driveways. So the water running off the sides filter through the earth and once again into the, as into the aquifer rather than running off into Red Hook Bay. So it, we're not just preserving our campus and reducing our footprint on the, in the world, we're reducing the footprint throughout the Red Hook area. And hopefully Red Hook Bay will see the benefits over a long period of time. We of course up to other nominal things which include organic gardening. We have beehives on campus. We have bat houses on campus. Um, and we also have a tree preserve for the, the tree bore, a, a preserve for the tree bore. All part of this program that we do to preserve and live an environmentally friendly existence and we incorporate it into our curriculum so not just the administration is doing it and i'm doing it but generations of bi montessori students will continue and expand these programs for time to come um, one of the basic things we started with years and years ago was installing led lighting um, and we continue i mean we don't know what a fluorescent light bulb looks like or an incandescent light bulb looks like and in fact we would love to ban incandescent light bulbs for sale in the virgin islands as we were also proponents of banning plastic bags so we we live the environmental life we're proud of it and as much as we've done we know we have more to do to stay current and to improve ourselves in fact uh you can imagine since we put in our first solar field in 2012 we originally started with 240 watt panels. We're now up to 360 watt panels and we will continue to expand and improve as technology improves. So thank you so much for being interested and we're welcome to participate and to grow and to expand and participate with UVI and all of you to make the earth a better and friendlier, environmentally friendly place. I thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vaughan, for that presentation and for talking about all of the projects that are happening at the Montessori School on St. Thomas. And now we're going to have another school speak uh, on St. John Gift Hill School. And uh, Kenneth Mills will be speaking. Thank you, Ariel, for the opportunity to share uh, some of the things that Gift Hill School is doing. Uh, the, very quickly, so people get oriented to Gift Hill School. As you said, we're, we're, we are on St. John. We uh, start with a two-year-old program and go all the way up to 12th grade. We are located on two different campuses. Our lower campus includes that toddler program, goes to fifth grade, and then just up the road a piece, but physically separated is the upper campus which is for grades uh, six through 12. All that, uh, I'm trying to make the slides go forward and there, there we go. All that we do at Gift Hill School is guided by uh, three uh, pillars. We refer to them as pillars, academic rigor, experience-based learning, which you're going to hear a lot about in a moment, and our commitment to community. I wanna take this opportunity to say that Gift Hill School takes its relationship with our community very seriously. We benefit a lot from what the community has to offer to us and we give back to the community as well. We, Even though we are an independent school, we very much consider ourselves a, uh, a community-based school and we take very seriously the mantra of private school with a public purpose. We actually employ three different technologies for growing produce here at, at Gift Hill School and all three technologies address in some way the unique challenges of growing fresh produce in the USVI, especially the issues of limited space, limited nutrient rich soil and the need to be very mindful of water usage on our island. Our uh, most well-established program is what we call our EARTH program. EARTH is an acronym for Environment and Resilience Through Horticulture. Uh, that was, this program was developed more than 10 years ago in partnership with Iowa State University. And working with them, they have helped us to build a substantial garden system on both of our campuses and also a variety of different kinds of garden, garden systems. As much as possible, um, we uh, work to vertically integrate our curriculum so that concepts that are presented to our youngest students are revisited in a mindful, thoughtful way as they progress up through our programs. And as an example, the Earth program starts with our very, very youngest students and as part of our curriculum in some form or another, all the way up to uh, 12th grade. Uh, another important feature of the Gift Hill School curriculum is that we purposely intertwine a variety of, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back one. We, all, we purposely intertwine a variety of, of disciplines into almost every course that we teach at almost every level. Uh, the Earth program may at face value seem to be just a pure agricultural program, but we infuse math and art and history and work especially hard to infuse components of Virgin Islands history in, in the Earth program, as we do with many of the courses here at Gift Hill School. This is a picture of our youngest students working in, in a garden, a raised, simple raised bed garden outside the classroom. If you look carefully, you'll notice that these young ones have these really large magnifying glasses as they start their, their uh, investigations into the garden. This is a picture of our fourth graders. Um, and the fourth graders here are working in a, in a much bigger garden. Of a, it's, it's a cage garden. There are about 30 raised bed gardens um, that, excuse me, there are 10 raised bed gardens in the fourth grade system here. And one of the things that you'll, you'll notice is the dirt here, the soil here is, is pretty dark. This is not normal here on, on St. John. And as part of the earth program and part of the experiential learning systems we have in place, these guys, along with just about every other grade level, are in some way involved in a composting program. So um, to grow um, produce on, on the island, whether it's a small raised bar, 
bed garden or a commercial size garden, you need good soil. And so one of the really important learning opportunities is those, for our students to learn how to do, do composting. The other thing to know about what's happening here with these fourth graders is that they use this garden to um, uh, incorporate math in their education. So if they're not planting or weeding or watering, they might be out there with, uh, with rulers and tape measures, uh, calculating surface areas and volumes um, and uh, calculating angles as well. In, in the fourth grade garden, the, the students pair up, they're, they're paired up and then they are responsible from the first day of school to the last day of school for taking care of that garden. They decide what goes into the garden, what gets planted, they make sure that it gets watered, they make sure that the, uh, the, plant, the food gets harvested. It becomes a fairly competitive process early on, but after a while, you, as you might imagine, they take great ownership of what they're doing. And if, if um, one of their classmates is absent and they notice a plant wilting, um, their first reaction is to um, water their friend's plant. So this is a real cooperative learning opportunity as, as, as well. Um, this is a picture, this picture here was taken early in uh, uh, September. This is the picture taken just last week. You can see these young ones really know uh, how, to, how to plant a garden. You can see a whole variety of crops there, lettuce, kale, uh, cilantro. You even see some corn there. So one of the learning opportunities is for the students to, on their own, they're figuring out what they wanna grow. Some things are gonna grow better than others. And the learning opportunity there is if something doesn't grow well, why is that? And so um, that I'm sure there's going to be a learning opportunity or two for this particular garden. Uh, this is an upper campus garden. Uh, it's similar in some ways to that fourth grade garden. It is caged, but it's, it's uh, orders of magnitude bigger. Um, there are about 30 of these raised bed gardens there. Uh, and there's also a section for um, a, a container system as well. Um, a, a second type of garden we have on the upper campus is a terrace garden system. What you're seeing here is just one level of a four tiered garden uh, on the upper campus. And so this addresses uh, the fact that at least here on St. John, uh, horizontal surfaces are pretty few and far between. So learning how to uh, grow productively on a, on a, on a system that's uh, or this, an environment where it's not horizontal is something that uh, we help our students understand. And a lot of this stuff ends up being transplanted uh, back home. The, 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 the young ones will often set up a little tiny garden in their, outside their kitchens at home and the, the older students are, are doing the same thing on, on a larger scale. Um, so the Earth program is, is one of our really established programs uh, and it does address some of the challenges of growing food in the USVI, but, but you know, it's, it's really a traditional agricultural system. It's soil, it's water, and it's sun. So last year, um, with, this, with significant financial support from Island Green Living and its president, Harith Wigrema, Gift Hill School started an aquaponics program. And this is Harith, by the way, harvesting our very first cucumber uh, last, last spring. Um, and you can see that um, in the background there to the side, how healthy the plants are. Um, Four minutes. Okay. So um, one of the things you need to know about the aquaponic system at Gift Hill School is that it is solar powered in a sense. We are, we are technically plugged into the uh, WAPA system, but we have solar panels on our roofs and we actually generate far more power than we used. And so uh, it's a soil free system, it's a solar powered system and our water is sourced from our cistern. Very quickly, this is our a graphic of our system. It's a 200 gallon tank, some pumps and filters and then two different types of growing beds. The, the one on the far right is basically pure water. The one on the left is water, water with um, some pebbles in it that allows some, some plants that need more structure to grow in to grow there. And this is our actual system, the 200 gallon tank in the foreground um, and tomato plants growing in that pebble system. And just be aware that that is, those are just three tomato plants growing crazily, healthily, uh, vibrantly in that system. A little closer look, you can see the system, you can start to see the, 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 uh, the, the lettuce on the right, a little closer look of uh, what's going on with our lettuce there. Um, 
last year when we planted our lettuce for the first time, it was, we planted it all at one time. It grew up really nicely all at one time. And then we harvested it. So we went from this boom or bust type of situation. And this year we're, we're, we're staggering our growth. So you can see young plants growing on the left and older plants growing on the right. So we'll always have uh, some crops growing. You can see the healthy root system that's growing there. And um, we use this system uh, for all of our grade levels uh, from sixth grade to 12th grade at the high school level. The chemists do the chemistry, the biologists do the biology, the, the, the physics and engineers play around with the lighting systems that we have and can adapt and change and actually do experiments. And like the earth system, this is vertically integrated in our program as well. Our first graders have just assembled a 10 gallon tank with this growing system on top of it. And our fifth graders have just assembled a, kind of an intermediate size system uh, with using 50 gallon fish tank and a 50 gallon uh, tank to grow their plants. Um, I'm just going to quickly, well, I, I couldn't avoid showing that image there with these little kids looking at our fish. I wanted just to put a, a word out there about FarmBot. This is another system we're using. It's a computerized system um, that allows the students who are not interested in getting their hands dirty to get engaged in planting uh, by using robotics and, and programming and engineering and simultaneously working with those students who have no care to work with robots and uh, but really like the gardening aspect. And as a, as a very quick point about the sustainability, this farm system, the FarmBot system allows you to water your plants and only, only the plants, you're not watering the, your own, the whole garden space. So this is amongst other things is a water conservation system and allows you to grow very efficiently. So those are three really, really quick overviews of three ways that we use gardens and um, produce here, uh, both in, as an educational opportunity and as a sustainable and um, resilient uh, pathway for our community. So thank you for the opportunity to share that with you. Um, and I pass it back to um, Ariel. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great to hear about uh, the program, the gardening program at Gift Hill School. And now we will be hearing from Erin Hutchins at Leatherback Brewing Company. All right. All right, anybody got me okay? Yes. Okay. Am I sharing my screen? Not yet. Okay. Try that again. Okay. Actually, Ariel, I'm seeing a block here. Can you move on and I'll come back? Maybe the next presenter and I can, I can go following. Okay. Network security block. I'll come back if, if that's okay. okay. So then the next presenter will be uh, Nija Youssef from Plaza Extra East on St. Croix. If you're ready to. I'm ready. Um, okay. Are you ready? And yeah, yeah, and I think that Greg will be sharing the screen for the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, you've, you've got control of the screen. So uh, thanks for having me. My name is Nija Youssef on behalf of the Youssef family here at Plaza Extra East in St. Croix. Um, first slide. All right, just, just wanted to present to you. This is the, the, the back of our supermarket at Plaza Extra East. And you can see that the driveway has a standpipe. Uh, with that standpipe, uh, we collect as much water as we can. Um, uh, from our rooftop, which you can see uh, part of the supermarket at the back of the store here. Um, that driveway also is a cistern. And with that cistern, we, we can capture about uh, a little over 500,000 gallons of water. Uh, so we, we try to catch as much rainwater as we can to conserve uh, what we can uh, in the rainwater. Uh, next slide, please. This is the, uh, the rooftop of uh, the supermarket as well as a, a smaller part of the shopping center. Uh, the first six big squares uh, was the initial uh, setup that we did. 
this was actually installed before Irma Maria. Uh, luckily, we, we had no damage, not one panel uh, was lost. Uh, because of the, uh, the system and the way the system worked, um, we, uh, we loved uh, you know, the production from it. Uh, we added two more squares to the back. Uh, so this total system here is about 750 kilowatts. Um, you can see at the edge of the building here, this is the roadway. There's a roadway uh, towards the front, uh, you know, the main highway. Uh, there's a white truck there. So from that white truck uh, to the edge of the corner of the uh, the first six square is where the, uh, the cistern is. So we use that driveway. That's where we collect our water uh, from the rooftop. Uh, Next slide. All right, this is our battery system. Uh, it sits on that 500,000 gallons uh, cistern uh, right on the edge. So we collect the power from the rooftop. Uh, we divert that into uh, the store's utility grid. Um, with that in mind, we use the power first from the solar and whatever's left over goes into the battery system. Uh, this is our first battery system that we purchased. It's about 500 kilowatt hours. Uh, with this system, it worked well, but it was not large enough for what we do. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of moving parts uh, in the supermarket, a lot of motors uh, running at the same time. Uh, so we purchased a second one. Uh, the second one is about 900 kilowatt hours, uh, which is at a set up at a different location. Uh, next slide, please. This is our reverse osmosis system. Uh, it's not too big. It's about 43,000 gallons uh, per day. Uh, I believe it runs about maybe uh, two to three times a day, uh, comes on and off uh, with a float switch. All right, next slide. Uh, in this location here, you can see that we have a five gallon bottle of water, three gallon bottle of water. And because of the electricity and the, um, uh, the water that we capture, we've decided to, to blow our own bottles. Uh, we, we are able to blow our bottles because uh, the electricity is, uh, you know, is at a cost of, a lot lower than what we can purchase it for at WAPA. So we blow our own uh, three gallon bottles, five gallon bottles. Uh, we sell uh, these bottles to different uh, water bottling companies in uh, the Virgin Islands. So we've got uh, a few guys on St. Thomas and St. Croix that are already using this as well as St. John. Uh, to the bottom of these bottles says made in the US Virgin Islands. Um, so because of the solar and the water, we're able to blow bottles, uh, fill these bottles up, uh, and then we're able to uh, produce ice. Uh, that is one large uh, factor that uh, we had an issue with. We were not able to get ice uh, from the local vendors. Uh, the capacity was not uh, not great, so we decided to get into the ice business um, uh, with the you know with the electricity and the water that uh, that we can capture. Next slide, please. Here is a, a part of the production of the ice plant. Um, the shoot that you see above is a chute that comes uh, from a bin. Uh, that bin uh, holds about uh, 20, 20 tons of ice, 20 tons of ice. Before Irma and Maria, we had two machines and those two machines were a 20 ton system. So each machine was 10 tons. Uh, since Irma and Maria, uh, we learned uh, as well as everyone, we learned our lesson. And we, we always say that we, we've got to change the way we do business uh, to accommodate uh, the island. Um, a lot of folks looked to us for, uh, for ice because we had already the largest capacity of ice on the island, uh, but it was still not enough. Uh, so uh, with the two 10 ton machines, we've added three more. So we have a capacity of uh, 50 tons. So you're talking about uh, 100,000 pounds of ice per day. Uh, and of course, uh, before Irma Maria, uh, we were out there in the middle of the storm bagging ice till four o'clock in the morning drenched in water. And you know we kept going just because we wanted the bin not to be full. Uh, so we, we engineered and we used, we integrated the technology that was out there um, with the solar, uh, with the, with the, uh, the, the machines uh, you know, going robotic where we don't have to bag it ourselves. We have to, we have to use the, the robotic system to, um, to bag it for us. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a short video of uh, of what, what the machine does, uh, we, can, we can add the speed or reduce the speed. Uh, right here, it's at a normal speed. Um, I believe right here, we can do about 2,000 2, bags at this speed per hour. Uh, there's a slide. 
this is the end part of our uh, ice plant. It's a robotic system that we bought. Uh, again, uh, we make ice uh, through a robotic system now, and this is all after Irma and Maria. So we all sat down and we said we gotta we gotta change the way we do things here with uh, with this ice production. We got into it, uh, so now we're you know we're stuck. We have to make sure that we can uh, supply and accommodate the island's uh, needs. Uh, so we purchased this robotic system. So now uh, when we make ice, uh, it, uh, no one touches the bag. It, it makes ice on its own. Everything's done by, by buttons and controls. Uh, we test our water on a weekly basis. Uh, and from there, uh, we're able to palletize it, wrap it, store it, uh, and, uh, and sell it to the different parts of the Virgin Islands. Uh, go ahead, nice, next slide. Uh, this is just uh, this is just the top of the robotic system. That, uh, we call this the arm, uh, and then at the end of the arm it has a suction. So uh, these bags of ice, uh, they're 11 pounds. Normally a, a store would sell 10 pounds, but we because of the, the cost savings from the electricity and uh, capturing the water and so forth, we've added one and a half pounds more to our production. So instead of calling it a, a 10 pound, we call it an 11 pound. Uh, and an 11 pounder is just because uh, you lose that half a pound traveling back and forth without it being in a freezer. So th these are uh, five bags of uh, 11 pounders that the robotic system sucks with, the, with its arm. And that's how it picks it up and moves it uh, uh, from pallet to pallet. Uh, this system can palletize on, on the left when it's done and it's been wrapped, it starts to palletize on the right. So there's no movement. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, you know, slowdown or anything of the robot system. All right, next slide. Uh, of course, with also saving, uh, conserving the water that we, uh, that we capture, uh, we send everything through the reverse osmosis system. Uh, everything's done back in that ice room. And from there, we, we send uh, those pipes to the front. So on the sidewalks of our stores, uh, we have uh, water that we dispense through a vending machine. Uh, and with that, uh, with that, we can lower the price of the water uh, just because it costs us less to produce it, less to clean it uh, versus the competition. So here you see we sell a gallon of water for 50 cents, which is uh, it's it's an incredible price. Um, we utilize this in another location as well, which is a, a gas station we just opened uh, in the end of the shopping center. Uh, we just opened it this year. Uh, we sent water pipe in that way as well. So we, we integrate the, uh, the vending machine on that side. Uh, just because we were producing the, pro the power here also, uh, we sent a high tension wire down over to the other side of the shopping center. And uh, having that, uh, we are able to produce, uh, you know, manufacture the bottles, the plastic bottles. We're able to supply the gas station with electricity from this shopping center. So we, um, we have a capacity of about 1.4 uh, uh, megawatt hour battery capacity. So if, uh, you know, during a, a nice sunny day, uh, we're pretty much producing power at no, no cost at all. Uh, the battery system is just uh, to cushion. If there's a, uh, you know, if there's a breaker that, that trips and throws off the solar system, we're on battery. Uh, and then it stores the energy, of course, like everyone else, it stores that power so that we can use the power at night when there's no sun. Uh, we get about five to five and a half hours of sunlight per day uh, on a good day. Uh, some days you have clouds and it's uh, you're not able to um, to produce the power, so you you'll use the, the power in the battery system uh, to pull that forward. Uh, next slide. Thank you very much for having me. Um, on behalf of the Yusuf family, I appreciate uh, everything. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Ms. Uh, Nia, uh, for your great presentation. Um, 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 oops, here we go. I am going to uh, please. Uh, Arya has some technical difficulties, so I will introduce our next speaker, which is Erin. Uh, Erin, do you have your slide, or you want me to share your slides for you? You are muted, Erin. You guys got me now? You got my screen up? Yes, your screen is up. Yes. So you want to take control? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, I appreciate being amongst kin kindred spirits and fellow Virgin Islanders. Uh, it's great to see so many awesome initiatives and efforts. I think everybody here is on the right page and doing 
really wonderful things. So my name is Aaron Hutchins. I'm the co-founder and managing partner at Leatherback Brewing Company. Um, we, we baked sustainability in to our mission from the very beginning when we were formed in 2017. We make well-crafted beer. We, we use Caribbean influences and island ingredients. We make traditional beers and we deeply engage our island communities and we really want to steward Caribbean life. And so that has been uh, just part of our core business model. <laughs> we're uh, very early on, we were certified as a eco business by the Virgin Islands Clean Coasts certification program. Um, and I'll describe some of our work that we're doing uh, for, for sustainability and renewable energy as we go forward. Major milestones for us as a company, we were established in 2017. We began brewing on generator power after Hurricane Zero Maria um, in 2018 at $10,000 a month in diesel fuel. Um, 20, later that year, we started exporting or sending beer to St. Thomas and selling beer in St. Thomas. And then we began exporting to Puerto Rico in 2019, in Florida in October 2020. Uh, we, and uh, earlier, about a year ago, we opened, built and opened our St. Thomas Brewery, which is a satellite operation, but it's where we do our uh, new product development and innovation. It's also a way for us to more deeply engage the greater Virgin Islands, not just be a St. Croix based company. Um, we intend to be very much throughout the entire Virgin Islands. Our production has been fairly steadily growing. Our current rate is 5,200 barrels. And just so you're aware, a barrel of beer is 31 gallons. So uh, we've been having steady growth. Um, we anticipate continued steady growth for the foreseeable future. We engineered our space so that it can grow quite substantially over time. And we just signed a lease for another, another 4,000 square feet on St. Croix, primarily to help us handle uh, shortages and supply chain issues associated with the global pandemic, shipping dynamics. Um, we've been... Uh, having more difficulties securing raw materials uh, from overseas for, for some of our key uh, production needs. Our, on the renewable energy side of the equation, we're happy to say that we're finally making our, our beer with 100% Virgin Islands sunshine and rain. The St. Thomas Brewery system is online uh, with our solar system. That is a, a smaller system. It's a 75 kilowatt system. The St. Croix Brewery is going to have a one acre um, solar array installed on our roof once the roof replacement is complete. So it's ongoing. The batteries are in place. Uh, combined, we have about 900 kilowatt hours of energy storage capacity. Um, we are very much concerned about our carbon footprint. So we're pleased that we can offset a half million pounds of carbon emissions a year by going with renewable energy. Obviously, it's a cheaper, higher quality, and more reliable power source as well. We are um, doing this, both uh, island operations are, are being set up as a power purchase agreement. So there's no upfront costs for us as a consumer, as the company buying this power. We pay the power purchase provider uh, a, a rate that is significantly less than WAPA. They own and maintain the systems over a long-term contract. So that's how it's working for us. On the other sustainability side of the equation, you know, the fact that we make our products in the Virgin Islands is certainly more sustainable. Our liquid products are primarily made with water. So our main ingredient by volume and weight is VI rainwater. Uh, so that significantly obviously reduces shipping costs and handling costs from bringing, importing in um, beer or other products from, from elsewhere. We're a full service brewery and that's more sustainable. And that's because we can offer other packaging alternatives beyond cans or bottles. In this case, it's kegs. Kegs are a very efficient way to uh, bring beer to market. They also offer a premium consumer experience and they have higher volume efficiencies than cans. So uh, and obviously less packaging costs. Um, we, right now we have about uh, just over a thousand kegs in circulation in our various markets, primarily here in the US Virgin Islands. We uh, have been recycling cans uh, from the very beginning. Uh, initially, we were working with the lo local scrap metal companies. Um, and eventually we got our staff involved and, and uh, staff pooled their resources, pooled their own personal funds and we bought a, a baler. So on St. Croix, we're a significant community recycler. We use cans in large part because they are 100% recyclable in the Caribbean, unlike glass. 
Um, cans are also safer and we don't, you know, we're not contributing to the beach glass, broken beach bottles, uh, beer bottles on the beaches and things like that. They're safer for the, for our consumers. They're more portable uh, and volumetrically, they're more efficient than um, a container with a long neck, like a glass bottle. Um, we, we, some of our byproducts include uh, spent grain, which has been used uh, heavily in the beer production process. We give our spent grains away to local farmers, both on St. Croix and St. Thomas. And this has uh, been something that's been very successful. The farmers have been very grateful. We're very grateful for them to help us remove this um, from our, our loading docks. Um, there's been a couple periods of drought where the Department of Agriculture could not land grain fast enough on St. Croix. And we had several cattle farmers telling us that our beer grains were the only thing keeping their herds uh, alive during, these, during the drought time. So um, we just keep making beer. They keep taking away the grain. It's a, it's a happy relationship. They also provide us with some of the local agricultural products like the lemongrass and sweet basil that we use in some of our beer products. Um, and this process engages in both uh, volunteers from outside as well as staff on their own time, both in the, uh, the can process and the grain process with farmers. Another part of what we'd like to do significantly is engage uh, in the community and, and basically have events that are in support of conservation and uh, sustainability initiatives. So a good example is when we have uh, launching next month is our passion fruit vanilla sour beer. We do is a limited release series every month. Karite is the Tayano word for shark. And this particular beer is in support of shark and marine conservation work in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands through a marine conservation organization called Conservación Consciencia. They work both uh, in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Um, we are very focused on being true to our roots and keeping it real for the people of the Virgins and the people of the Caribbean. Um, we do everything we can with intention and with love. And that is where I'm going to end my presentation. There's much more to come from us. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, I will let Ariel uh, speak again. Um, I think she was able to join us uh, with a different, uh, with a different, um... here you go, Aria. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And now we'll be hearing from Arnold uh, Rahelio and Doug White about um, being off the grid. So if you'd like to start. Doug, are you ready? You here and share the screen. Um, and Doug, we see your... Can you, can you see it? Can you see that now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, uh, Jello, uh, who's a good friend of mine, didn't make it today, uh, but he's a, a native Virgin Islander who I've known for years who actually does it, lives off the grid because when he built his house, it would have cost him more money to send uh, to run a WAPA line to his house than it was for him to go off grid. So we've been sharing solar stories uh, and recycle batteries for years. But I just wanted to say that, first of all, uh, we have these really awesome presentations today. That uh, And it's so uh, heartwarming to see that both our schools and our businesses are really adopting um, renewable energy, solar power, and sustainable living techniques in both their education and in their operations. And I think that that is uh, just uh, awesome and very, very exciting. But um, that, um, everyone can have solar power. And so uh, I wanted to uh, go and talk about actually solar water pumping, a very low cost, low tech, uh, very easy to do uh, DC uh, solar water pumping system that, uh, and I built this system after Hurricane Maryland. Uh, I have a larger system in my house, a PV system, uh, but that was partially damaged after Hurricane Maryland. And um, <clears throat> so I had, uh, so it, it takes just four components, uh, 
so, uh, solar panels, batteries, a charge controller, and you see in the photograph on, on the upper right that you have a conventional uh, AC water pump and right next to it you have a 12 volt, either 12 or 24 volt uh, DC water pump and those are valved off so that you can have the water going to either one of those pumps at one time and they both have switches so that they're either, only one is on at one, one time. But um, my PV system was damaged after Maryland. And so I actually found these solar panels on the side of the road that people had thrown them out. They were cracked, um, but they were still producing power. And uh, they're just laying outside and uh, they can be easily picked up and moved inside if there's a storm coming. Um, and they've been producing power for four, for four years now since, um, since the hurricane, you know. Also, the uh, batteries on, on the lower left are uh, recycled uh, electric car batteries from uh, one of my early solar powered mini trucks that, uh, and these batteries are probably uh, at least 15 years old. And they're, they, they certainly aren't producing uh, enough power to run uh, a vehicle, but uh, they are producing enough power to run a very small pump. So the message that I'm, I'm uh, trying to sp shed, sp share here is that uh, batteries have a very long life as well as solar panels. And then the other component that you would need to run your house totally off grid on solar uh, would be just a small charge controller. You can see here this charge controller, these panels are keeping these batteries topped up at uh, over 13 volts. So um, some things uh, just for you to keep in mind is that um, solar panels and batteries have a very long afterlife after their uh, initial um, you know, usage or, or time is uh, for their first use is over. Um, solar panels have warranties to produce at least 80% of their power for 25 years. And I have solar panels that are 28 over 28 years old, and they're still producing power, uh, running drip irrigation and smaller jobs they are in my house, but they're still useful. And also solar panels have no moving parts. They require no fuel other than sunshine. They require almost maintenance and they make no noise. So they're just sitting up on your house for uh, 20, 25 years uh, producing power and that batteries are infinitely recyclable. They're reusable. I used to uh, buy the, if any of you all remember the Atlantis submarines that were here years and years ago, they had to replace their batteries quite frequently. And then they would sell those batteries. I would buy them and use them for about eight years to back up my solar panel. And then when I was finished with those, I would give them to Jello, and he would use them for another uh, six or seven years. And then when, when they're uh, at the totally end of their life, then you take them down to the auto parts store, and they'll pay you for them to recycle them. So... Um, and then just thank you all for listening. And, and this is a, a system, a, a photograph of my uh, system that I have at my house. It's a 13 kW uh, inverter system with uh, 800 amp hour uh, batteries. And I um, run the whole house uh, without uh, generate actually more power than I use, including running air conditioning in the bedroom 24 seven and charging two electric vehicles. And this system is capable of running the whole house uh, overnight, um, you know, in a power outage. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to hear like how we can bring it home. Um, and also I just want to thank all of the presenters. Um, for talking about some of the amazing things that are happening here in the Virgin Islands. And I wanted to open the floor to any questions that the audience may have. Uh, so if the presenters can come join, join back on or you know, bring up your video, uh, then uh, the audience can ask any questions. I have a, a one question, uh, Doug. What is the point of having the uh, charge controller? 
The charge controller uh, keeps the uh, batteries from getting overcharged. Because if you just have the solar panels going directly to the batteries, it is possible to overcharge the batteries, and that that will that's the one thing that will kill batteries pretty quickly is if they uh, get too much power. So it's a regulator for, for the batteries. Thank you. Um, I have one question for um, any question from the audience. I have a, a question for you, uh, Nijay. It's Nijay, sorry? Nijay. Nijay, sorry. I have a question for you, Nijay. Um, when are we going to get something like that on St. Thomas? This is a pretty awesome setup that you have. Well, um, St. Thomas is in the works. I used to, I, we used to own and operate uh, that location for many years. Um, my wife and kids still live in St. Thomas. And I'm actually the guy on the hill uh, on Skyline with the wind generator, but I brought it down uh, for a little bit now. But um, uh, I'm over in St. Croix now helping my, my brothers out here with this supermarket. Uh, in this, on St. Croix, we are building a 365,000 square foot building. Uh, and with that building, we have about seven acres of rooftop that we're going to put completely solar panels on there. So it's seven acres. I mean, that's that's a big deal. Seven acres. So you're looking about maybe about a seven to eight megawatt system, and we're going to run that building completely on solar and batteries. So uh, back to your question, St. Thomas is in the works, but it's it's still a little bit uh, a ways because uh, we're focusing more on the St. Croix location before we um we we try to go out to St. Thomas again. And Thank and you. like uh and like uh, Mr. White said here, Douglas White, uh, solar is. It's, it's amazing. It, there's no moving parts. I mean, it's, you know, you go up on the roof and you clean the panels every once in a while. But uh, I mean, I have a wind generator. I have to bring it down when the, you know, you know, after the storm, I brought it, I mean, before the storm, I brought it down. Uh, but of course it got damaged. I purchased a new one. So I'm about to put up a, a new turbine on the, uh, on the head, but you know, it, it's got moving parts. You know, I have to maintain it. I have to grease it, lube it and so forth. But with solar panels, it's, it's the way to go. And um, there's one question from the audience about the system. I think it's a, it's a bit of a mystery to have a system under your parking lot. Can you explain a bit more about the volume of that system and, and stuff like that and when it was built? Well, the system, um, the system was actually built after we built the supermarket. Um, uh, and that's because we, you know, when you have a large roof space, that water has to go somewhere. I mean, we, we took grass and dirt where the water would have naturally gone through the, the grass and dirt and we exchange it with concrete, so, which is the rooftop. Um, so, you know, that water, you have to control the pressure coming from those pipes going into the uh, the main roads and so forth. So uh, it's like a retention pond. A cistern would be something where you kind of dump it into a cistern and you either use it or you uh, slow down the, you know, you, you kind of reduce the flow back onto the, uh, the roadside. Uh, in our case, we use the cistern uh, to produce water, uh, you know, to bottle water after we RO it, uh, we use it for ice, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, we, you know, it's it's something that we use in the store and we use to bottle and sell water. Uh, you know, we, we, we sell water on the sidewalk as well, all because of the capacity of the system. Now, the size, of course, depends on the size of the roof. If you have too much of a, of a system and it doesn't hurt, but it costs a lot more money, sometimes it doesn't make sense if your system is too small. Then you're you're constantly overfilling the cistern, uh, but really the five about five hundred thousand uh, five hundred thousand gallon cistern is just right for us because uh, with that cistern we also sell water to the truckers. Uh, I don't I, I can't remember anyone here having a large capacity like we do. Uh, so when these guys, uh, for example, Marco Water and and some of these other truckers, uh, you know when they run low on water when there's a drought, um, they come out to us and and we have the capacity. Uh, if we don't use the uh, the water right away, we store it. You know, when water sits in in a cistern, it, it doesn't it doesn't have bacteria really because you have no sunlight and so forth. Um, and as long as you maintain the uh, the water, you're good. But uh, because of the 500,000 gallon system, also and the amount of ice we produce uh, with that cistern, we were able to keep flushing it out and 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 saving space again for more rainwater. So we like we like to do the um, the rainwater. Uh, we like to use the rainwater, so we always keep the cistern at a, a low capacity. So when we do get that rain, we try not to send it out to the main road. We try to uh, hold it and and uh, and, uh, and use it. Um, with the solar panels, because we're so much into 
solar now, you know, renewable energy. Uh, we bring in solar panels by container loads. And with that, uh, we're able to share those costs at a lower price for a lot of other businesses here on island that have already purchased panels from us. Uh, there's a lot of homeowners uh, that buy per, uh, sign up, uh, solar panels from us. Uh, we're getting into the charge controllers. Uh, we are an Enphase distributor. Uh, uh, that is a competition to um, the Tesla batteries. Uh, we have uh, Canadian solars that we sell by either one panel, one pallet, uh, one panel or one container load. Uh, we have all of the racking inverters and so forth. So we're, we're, we're using it for ourselves and we're educating a lot of folks on the, uh, on the system as well. This is, this is really fantastic and, and great to hear. Um, we have just a few more minutes. I just wanna have uh, one question for our educators. Um, what, uh, what is, how are you, so um, Mr. Mills on St. John, you explained a, a fair amount of how you integrating some of the, the work uh, into the curriculum. Um, so I would love to ask that same question um, to Mr. Bourne, but I also would like to ask both of you if you've seen any improvement or any changes in your students since you've started those uh, sustainable practices and those efforts to make your campus more sustainable in general. Well, if, if I may, um, hopefully not to embarrass you too much, but your lead today, Ariel Stoltz, a graduate of our school and i'd like to think that our environmental orientation was instrumental in in guiding her career choice um and she's just one of numerous students that are going through this path uh who i mean whether it's guilt by association of just you know ironically you know greg one of the the, the my biggest problems is that since we generate so much solar energy our students are having fun with how best to use it, you know. And and on the flip side, during this COVID crisis, given our solar production, we have the luxury of actually opening windows and turning on air conditioning to maximize the airflow to mitigate COVID. I'm not sure how many people can afford to do what seems to be a ludicrous scenario of AC cranking and windows open. But when you have 100% solar, you, you can do this. Um, and so it, it, hopefully it's a, a contributing factor to our great operation with COVID. Um, and we literally have classes, looks like as Ken is talking about how you know students learn about whether it's organic gardening, solar systems, the, uh, just the whole process in the water. And just like Nijay, we have an assistant underneath our, our driveway. Um, and especially in St. Thomas, where our terrain is so vertical, when you excavate to put in a road, a driveway, a house, or anything, it's a natural architectural flow. So instead of just backfilling, you make that a system. And more and more people should do it because EJ's evidence right there, 500,000 gallon system that generates tremendous profits for him. And as I said, we have a 100,000 gallon system that waters our soccer field and, 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 the, and the like. This is, again, this is really, really exciting. Um, so this is the end of our series. Arya, do you want to close? Um, I'm happy to, but um, are you still with us, Arya? Yes. Uh, yeah, th thank you everyone so much. I think we learned a lot today um, about all of the amazing efforts that are happening here in the Virgin Islands. And um, I think, you know, this is just like a taste of it because there's many more um, people that weren't able to speak today, um, other businesses, schools, uh, homeowners who are doing the same thing. And um, we really hope that this highlights that it's possible, um, that you can do it too, and that um, it's really important for our future that we are making decisions that enable um, future generations to have the same resources and available as we do. And so, yeah, we, we just hope that this kind of inspires you to um, look at, look at your, um, your business or your home and see how you can be more sustainable as well. And um, so before we uh, close, I just wanna bring up again that we at the Caribbean Green Technology Center are working on a comprehensive energy strategy uh, we think this is extremely important because as we move forward into this energy transition, um, 
there is so many things going on, so many different sectors involved and different actors and players. And so it's important that we have um, some collab or cooperation between the different um, aspects and that we think about it in advance so that later down the road, we can really enable this change to happen. And um, so please look out for more um, community engagement events regarding the conference of energy strategy. And so, yeah, this is the end of our energy month, uh, but we're really glad if you were able to listen in and um, hope that you enjoyed uh, the, the different webinars. And so thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Perfect.